Hi, I'm Lucas Meldon and welcome to That Windsurf Podcast. This is the podcast where we have conversations with people in and around the windsurf community with a new topic and new guests each week. If you enjoyed the podcast, then don't hesitate to give it a like and subscribe so you're up to date with all the latest ones. If you're feeling extra generous, you can always head over to buymeacoffee.com slash lucask579. That will be in the description and that will be very much appreciated. So yeah, if you know anybody else who might like it, then let them know and share the pod. It's now up on a few platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Anyway, enough about that. Let's get into it. Aruba, Wes, Australia. Sil, Eliake, Cape Town. That could be dramatic. <laughs> that would be a dream tour. Every time. <laughs> going to go straight back into Victor and Sarah part two. Obviously there's more with these guys in part one but you don't have to listen to that. You can jump straight in with this one so enjoy. Right let's get a little bit into the actual competing and what do you guys because obviously you are just competition machines both of you so how do you prepare for the heats? How are you feeling before the heats? I think as I said before all these little events uh, when I was young helped me to become more relaxed. But my first event as a junior, I was super nervous because everything was new and I was pretty lost. Uh, sometimes in some course racing, I was taking the wrong buoy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you see, you see the, the, how they draw their buoys and stuff. But then the race area was so big that sometimes I was maybe leading the race, but I was waiting for the, sa- the guy behind me to to know which boy I have to <laughs> It happened to me one time in the Spanish Cup in, um, in La Manga in Murcia. I was leading this race in Formula Racing and then I didn't know which boy to take and I just let pass the other guy. And uh, because Otherwise I would make it wrong and I would be last. So I thought, okay, let's, let's just leave this guy pass and pretty smart. go behind him. Yeah, and then I don't know, I prepare for waves. I try to go earlier to the to the spot where I'm competing, just to to prepare my equipment. It's really important uh, to tune my boards, to tune my sails. And uh, for example, in Pozo, I go one month before because uh, Pozo is gives you a lot of. Um, I think you have you need a lot of experience there. If you you are coming, for example, from a light wind spot and you are going to Pozo, it takes you at least like a week to get used to the strong winds. And uh, I spent a lot of summer there. Uh, since I'm 14 years old, I'm going every summer to Pozo for two months. So now I know exactly what I have to use there mm-hmm. and uh, where to pick up the, the right wave. And uh, I really like to sail on 3.4, 3.7 overpowered. But if you are coming from Maui straight there, it can be really, really stressful sometimes. And uh, I also try to don't get to to don't sell so much before the, the week of the competition, certain time in the water, the week before the event, because you can get hurt just before the, the, the event starts, especially in post, everybody's pushing each other, going for crazy moves. And you don't want to get injured before the event. Yeah. <laughs> I remember like, uh, I don't know if you have something like the similar or anything, but we were speaking to Adam a couple of weeks back and he has this like, uh, brain meditation music thing he put it in his ear like sometimes <laughs> mm-hmm. are you, are you just... I, I, I like to listen to my music with my headphones because you know when the, the when the competition starts everybody's coming to you ah what do you think about the conditions today and I, I don't I don't really use like meditation music I like more music to to keep me up the yeah yeah, yeah. The, like, to go full on <laughs> just before my hit it's really important that you don't get on a negative side, that you stay positive. And I just take it as a normal day of training when I go into my heat. So I try to, like this, I get less nervous, you know, to be away from things that makes me a bit more uncomfortable. So I just try to put my music and I like to rig my stuff even if, if I have a caddy that helps me to do it. I like to set it up as I want. And uh, yeah, just take it as a normal day. In Pozo, you don't need many sails because pretty much every day is kind of the same wing, like with two or three sizes to our co- kind of cover. And yeah, I try to sail always with all kind of tights in Pozo because every time you have your hits, maybe it's the worst tight uh, with less waves. 
you want the best conditions, but normally you get you get the worst conditions. But the wind is really not super gusty, and everything changes completely. Like just like Victor, I also try to go to the, especially for waves. I try to go to the events earlier and get used to the conditions. Um, I am not so good at like timing when I go sailing or not. Like for me, it's more like if I feel like sailing, I'm going to be on the water, even if I have to compete or not. You know. And a lot of times I have this extra kick like the day before the event. So I end up sailing too much that day. <laughs> but I'll, I'll come off the water satisfied, you know, and like pumped up to, to compete the rest of the week. Um, I, I can get very, very nervous for heats. But I have also been competing since, I've, since I'm a kid. Like I, I did competitive swimming. And I, like a lot of other sports, like I've competed a lot as a kid. So I think I've learned through that to like deal with the nervousness. And um, I think one guy, like with swimming, this person told me one time, like, if you're not nervous, it means you're not, like, excited or you're not going to be able to perform. Like, being nervous should be a positive thing. There were some times that I was too nervous and I wasn't able to control it. And then, um, but I've learned to, yeah, I've learned to control that, I guess. I play, I get really hyped up before my heat. I have this, like, soca music, like, it's this Car Caribbean carnival music. And yeah, it really gets you going before you have to go sailing. Um, and I think for me, the idea behind that is that I just, I just enjoy competing and I enjoy being on the water. So I, I am focused, but I'm also just excited to get out there and do my best. Because in the end, um, yeah, I want to win the heat, but I also just want to yeah, perform really well. Like my, the most satisfaction I get is if I do heat with all the moves that I wanted to land. I don't, yeah, I also separate myself a bit from other people. Like I stay near my kids very often. I have this thing that I'm like right before my heat, the morning though, I don't like to go out for like practice runs so much because I'm scared I'm going to run out of my best moves, you know. <laughs> I rather do them in my heat. So I'll go do a couple of runs here and there. But I'm, yeah, I'm not trying my best moves when I'm practicing. So the night before I'll go out, all out, but the day of, before my heat, I wait till I get in my heat to like bust out everything. Are you, yeah. is it different to, to wave, freestyle and racing or is it pretty similar? Yeah, so for waves, I'm the least stressed because since I come for freestyle where we used to have five minute heats and now it's like nine minute heats, it, it goes really fast and you have to perform everything very quickly. But then I started doing wave sailing and all of a sudden I had, I had like 12 to 16 minutes to do, to do two jumps and a couple of wave rides, you know. So it's like for me, it's a, it's a total holiday sailing a wave heat. Mm -hmm. And it's just a lot of fun because it gives you the time to like put some waves and some jumps together without being too stressed. I think freestyling is the hardest one of all because you have to be so on point and you have to land so many moves. And then slalom. Slalom I can also get a bit nervous for but I in the end for competition it's like the best feeling because the moment like when you have like 20 seconds before the green flag goes up like the adrenaline that starts pulsing through your body is crazy and like going through the first mark yeah it's the craziest feeling so yeah it's uh I think for all disciplines there's something that I really like about it like, secretly racing is maybe the best feeling competing yeah it's a different feeling yeah it's a lo lot a lot like more people for, for me for me, in waves, I just kind of try to compete against myself because in the uh, at the end of the day, you can't really be watching the, the your opponent because you can be jumping and the other guy can be riding. And, uh, yeah. Sometimes you see something, you know, when you're really close together, for sure. But for me, it just makes me more calm when I'm in my routine and I just do my own thing and I just follow the conditions, how they come. That's how I feel best. And uh, yeah, I take it as a free sailing kind of hit because I, I love to compete, but uh, more against me. I, I like to see how far I can go when I'm in a, in a hit. So sometimes I push a little bit more than when I'm just training, especially when it's before the event. I don't like, like Saraguita to go crazy and maybe just start doing doubles in the warm up because you can get hurt. And maybe you are giving out your energy and then you have less energy for your hit. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, like, keep... you're obviously not one of those people who, like, follows around to try and see what the other guy does. But you do have those moments where you do catch someone doing a, a trick. And if that trick is, like, a super sick trick or a super high-scoring move, is yeah. do you feel pressure at that moment? 
or do you still try and get it out? I try to stay focused on myself because only with that move doesn't mean that you make the hit. You have to you have to do also seek wave rights to go through. You know, not only with one ten point right to go through. We've been seeing a lot of hits where you have six jumps, but if you don't make high wave scores, you don't go through. Mm. <laughs> and um, you are taking more risk on the really high jumps in Poso, actually. But you can do these jumps in within one run. You can get two tens maybe. And the wave rides, they take a long time to select the wave and to have kind of a flow in the wave and connect the, the turns, the tricks. I, I never give up. Even if I see a sick stall fall double over me, <laughs> uh, for sure I know, I okay, if he has this, maybe I should do a stall double as well because I have a normal double. <laughs> but mm. I like this game. It's it's kind of a nice game. That's why we surfing is so fun because it's always so difficult and there's always something else. Both of you must have gone through some situations in heats where you're having a bit of a mare, you know, you've you've gone through half your heat and you've you know you've crashed and everything. How do you try and restart your heat when you're you know you've done already half the heat it's so bad? It's really hard because sometimes you don't have many chances. Especially when you only have wave riding conditions and there's like long periods in for the good waves. And then there are four guys in the water and there are maybe two, three good waves coming. Like it happens here at keep a lot. If you don't get the kind of the big one that connects and you do only one, two turns, you don't make it through, even if you do very well. So it's really tricky sometimes because you know you can do more, but you are not in the right moment or you didn't take the right decision before. Uh, that big set came and you think it's going to come another one like that no, it might not even in 30 minutes mm. yeah uh, it's kind of when we compete on Maui it's, it's like same as surfing you know sometimes you see a hit of 30 minutes and they just got two waves each and it had happened the la in the last Aloha Classic here I did two hits <laughs> and I got two waves in my first hit and then in my second one, I got one and a half waves <laughs> in yeah. 30 minutes. I took the wrong decisions when I could have gone maybe on a really big wave. But then I thought, okay, if I go on this one and I get stuck like on my first hit for 15 minutes in the inside and I cannot make it out, I need a second wave. So you have to be really selective. This is really tricky mm. when you compete in these conditions. Yeah. I don't know how to get, to, to get through this. Sometimes you just can't. But it's just experience for the next one, you know? Yeah. I, okay, maybe in the next one, I just need to rig. Uh, I have to come with a massive board, you know, just to make it to make it out and get the big waves, even if I cannot be so radical, just to make it through. Because yeah. that's competition. Sometimes the, the, the best turn doesn't win. It's the wave selection it makes yeah. you win. Uh, Sarah, I know you don't lose very often in freestyle, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> How do you like, I mean, I guess you must have had some starts where it's not so good. Yeah, so I was thinking about it. And I think, so in freestyle, I haven't had many of them. I do know, I'm not sure I've recovered from those in freestyle. And like, if it goes, what, what could happen is that maybe you start too big and you don't land the big moves. And maybe by the end, you realize actually, like you don't necessarily need the biggest moves to win. Like you just need a couple of safe moves. So I think that has maybe helped once or twice that by the end, I just like scrape through by landing just some safe moves and just reminding yourself that you don't need to do the biggest moves. So that will help to get through the heat, if, even if you start bad. Um, I've been thinking back in waves and I think I've had a couple of bad heats where I just wasn't able to come out of it. And um, that's like Victor said, it has to do a lot with the conditions because you, you want, you may want to, you may want it as so badly, but maybe the wave doesn't come, you know? So that has like, that makes it extra hard. The only discipline where I felt like I've, I've been able to come back is in, is in slalom. Like even though I've had a bad start um, or somehow with slalom, you still have like about, you know, there's three more jives that you can do every time to, to recover. Um, and I think it's just a mindset for slalom at least that the race isn't over until it's over. Like the person in front of you can still fall on the jive or you catch a gust that another person hasn't caught. So with slalom, I always feel like it's never over till it's over. With freestyle and, and waves is a bit more technical with the moves and that makes it a bit harder to recover. 
your like your first victories, where it was and, and how it was, and also like the best victory you've had. First victory, I guess. I and PWA like the first time I got on the podium with freestyling was was a third place, and for me that was yeah that was pretty amazing because I just came there, like I got this opportunity from Starboard. They paid my ticket to go there, so I didn't have any expectations. But then to make it onto the podium was really really awesome, and I think that was like the extra motivation to keep on training. So for me, one of the most memorable ones was um, actually the event we had here in Aruba. Like I won both the freestyle and the slalom. And that year was the first year I won the slalom, the slalom title also. So for me, that was just one of the very memorable events to win both events. And I think the first, first time I got on the podium for wave sailing also felt amazing. So every, every new thing feels really cool. Yeah. And Victor, what's your most... I know uh, the last world title you got was a pretty nervous one in silt. Uh, pretty hectic. The last world title? Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, well, man. Yeah, that, that, that one was a bit, yeah, a bit uh, different. <laughs> but uh, I think one of my best memories, it was my first uh, PWA Poso event victory in 2006. Uh, a final against Kauli Seadi. It was really, really amazing. Because before that, I, I, never, I was never in, in the podium. I got fourth place the year before. I was really close. And then the year after, I just uh, won the event for the first time in my life. And then I won, I won the event three years in a row. And then, uh, yeah, 11 years, I was first or second until the last two years that I got fourth. So, yeah, it's just been, like, for me, a really friendly place, a uh, <laughs> place that I worked really hard to win there. And uh, good memories with a lot of different riders, from Cowley uh, to Danny Bruch also. Uh, one time he in the single we compete in the final. Ricardo Campello, Marsilio, Philip, many times. It's been epic. Mm-hmm. I, I still cannot believe that I have competed there so many times, so many years. And every time I compete there, uh, if I get to the top four, it's still uh, unbelievable because it's, the level keeps going up year by year and you, you have to push yourself more. Uh, yeah, those victories have been amazing for me. Also, for sure, the world title, the first world title, it, uh, it was kind of a goal that was um, was not so far from me because I got two times uh, vice world champion, uh, 2007 and 2008, and then 2010 I won. Yeah, these ones are really, like, I could never, I will never forget these moments. Mm-hmm. For you, Sarah, which has been, like, the most the memorable world title? Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about all of them, but this last wave title is really, really special. Um, just, yeah, mostly just because I, I don't have a wave sailing background, you know, so and it's the first discipline that I, like, consciously was, like, really training hard for. And then, again, to win it in Maui in, a con- in conditions, yeah, in a place that's pretty hard. Uh, at the end of the year, because the title was still kind of tight between Justina Ibai and I. And you know, it's the first time in years that anyone had, had beaten the Twins, you know. So, yeah, just for several reasons. I think that the last wave title for me is um, a very cool one. For you especially, but also for Victor, your your massive role models. And um, I was wondering, like, what have you had any impact on, on your home island and, and country in Aruba? Yeah, so... I mean, kind of sadly, windsurfing is not a big, big sport in Aruba. But, um, yeah, because of the success I've had over the past years, like, it's a small island, it's a small community, you know, so everyone knows each other. So anywhere I go, people are always saying hi to me. They're taking pictures. They're always, but the nicest thing is they're always congratulating me and asking me, like, oh, when are we going for the next competition? They don't tell me, like, when are you going? They say we, as in, like, like the whole (laughs) island is behind me, you know? And that's a really cool feeling. From, from, from the island. Kids ask me for, because I have to do presentations at school and stuff, or, you know, they invite me for stuff like that very often here. So I feel like um, in that way, I think, um, yeah, it's, I, I been, I've been a positive role model for, for kids here, just to show that you're able to study and practice a sport as well. And I think that's the main thing that I also want to show to kids here in Aruba, that sports is important, but school is also important. Like, I, I got my, my bachelor diploma in Holland, and, and I kept on windsurfing at the same time. So, yeah, yeah I just want to... That's pretty cool, yeah. Try, try and get the kids involved and 
And yeah. uh, Victor, I know you've been really trying to push the kids with your new event in Almeria. Yeah. Um, so how did that like start? Was that your idea? Kind of like I, well, they already started uh, with this uh, juniors event in, uh, in Pozo where we were doing the, our PWA World Cup. Uh, but I just thought that it would be a good idea to have one event just for juniors. And I talked to the PWA and they agreed. They thought it was a good idea. I don't know, for the image of the sport, that we get more kids into the sport and they have one event just for themselves. And uh, yeah, it, it, from my club, Victor Fernandez, like with my dad and my brother and my, my aunt, we all work together and we just put this event up for the juniors and we did it three times in a row. Let's hope we can make it four. I don't know how things are gonna be also for us to, to put this event up because we also need sponsors and uh, it's gonna be hard for 2021, we'll see. But I, I like the idea to do these kind of events because they don't have many events, the juniors. And this one is like a nice community, parents and kids together. And we do also some activities behind windsurfing uh, during the event and they really liked it. And it's a good time of the year, beginning of the year, in January, uh, not much is happening still in the windsurfing world. Uh, yeah, we have a great place in Almerimar, a good setup. Uh, conditions can be really good. You have to be lucky because it's only four days window. And, you know, we have some events with seven days and we hardly have maybe one day to compete sometimes, even in the canaries. It, ha mm -hmm. it had happened, but we tried to to make it again and and yeah, I'm really happy to support this event. And besides studies, they can also do some competitions. For sure, studies are really important nowadays because it's really hard to live from winds, only from windsurfing, but uh, there are also more windows. Like you can meet a lot of people and maybe get some other job because of windsurfing because you have met uh, people from all over the world, from all different countries. That's what, why windsurfing family is so nice, you know? You just travel so much, meet so many people. We go to beautiful places, beautiful spots. And that's how I, I am here now, Maui. I think it's great. I think it's great that um, the, the, the event that you're putting on, and we hope you can continue doing that. But have you had any like competition nightmares or where everything just goes wrong or you miss a heat or, or anything like that? I didn't miss a heat, but I had one in Pozo just the year before I won the event in 2006 that, you know, I was so concentrated with my headphones and everything. And um, they changed from two jumps to three jumps. And, uh, but they didn't stop the competition or anything to say, okay, we're going to change, you know? So I was up wind of the beach in Pozo. I went to try my sales and I was on the heat after, but it was already the next round. And they have changed the format to three jumps, three different jumps. So I was in the two two jumps mode still from the round before. So I forgot to do this third different jump. And even though I won in in with in one judge, just with two jumps and my wife rides. But I was really down after this hit because you know, you just come off the wall and they come to you, hey, why didn't you do a third jump? And I say, But you didn't you didn't tell me anything, you know, I didn't see any changes. Uh, yeah, mm. I was, that was really hard to take, but I, I learned from that. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, things that happen in competitions, you have to be always checking what they change. And that's why it's really hard to compete in, in windsurfing, especially in West, because conditions tight, they change and then they stop and then you don't know what time you're going to compete. And it's really hard to organize yourself, how you're going to eat, how you're going to sleep and which equipment you're going to use. You never know until the, the time comes. Yeah, but that was a hard one to take, but uh, I learned from that. And I'm not the only one that it happened. I think Brasinho had the same thing a few years ago in Tenerife. Yeah. I remember that. And uh, it, it happened exactly the same thing that happened to me. <laughs> Sarah, have you had any disasters or has it all been clean um, sailing for you? No, so, yeah, so most disasters are uh, during slalom. Like, um, I, I wasn't like, uh, the worst ones in slalom are when you miss the buoy, I think there's, I think I did it twice. The first time I remember was years ago and I was leading the heat, but it's like, that was one of the first times I was leading a, a heat, you know? So then instead of 
I just missed the buoy and I went to the, instead of going to the second buoy, I went to the fourth buoy or something, you know? And then when I came back to the beach, I see a bunch of people waving and I'm like, yeah, I guess I almost won. And then I realized that I totally missed it, you know? So that was pretty disappointing. But this happened to me again in 2017. That was the last year I did um, the whole tour for Slalom. And uh, the event title, the world title was riding on the event there in, um, in Denmark on the last on the last race, like it was between me and Delphine and where I was in qualifying position to go to the final. Um, but I missed the mark. I, the whole heat followed me and we, we finished and then we heard we all got disqualified. So I couldn't go to the finals and Delphine made it to the finals. Um, so I said, you know, I blew it. And the whole reason, um, I would still have a chance in New Caledonia, but I could have won it then and there. And then I look up and I see Delphine racing and I realize that she had to win that heat to win uh, that event. And she finished like third or fourth. So in the end, I won that event anyway. And I won <laughs> the title. But then I decided not to go to New Caledonia because I, I just needed a break from the traveling because I had already won the title. So it was in, in, in Brazil. And I received an email from the, the, the PWA where they made a calculating mistake and I actually hadn't won the title. So I had to go oh. and rebook my tickets and go and compete at New Caledonia anyway. So that was like a bit of a nightmare where you've been awarded the title a year, a, a month, two months prior, and then you have to go and redo it again. So that was a bit of a nightmare also because New Caledonia is such a remote place to get to. I, had to, I still had an event in Mexico. So I was in Brazil, had to fly to Mexico, flew back to Aruba, then flew to Amsterdam and get, to get to New Caledonia. I'm getting so tired was, hearing about it. Yeah, that was quite, <laughs> quite the experience. But I'm, I mean, I'm grateful in the end that I did manage to, to win the, the title. But that was like a mistake of my own and from other people. In the end, it turned out fine. It's a good story. How long are you thinking of, of continuing? Are you going to be 10 years, 20 years still going on the tour? Or when do you think is the time to, to slowly maybe do less events? For me, for me, the time will say. We don't have many events anyway, so I would keep uh, doing it as long as I, I can. Especially wave, wave events, we don't have many. So it's just fun for me to keep doing them because I, I like to compete against the best guys in the world. As long as I can, and as long as I feel fit and with chances to compete against them, I will. Definitely, there's people who like retire early and they just want to go and have fun and free sail. But yeah, I guess you two are both like it's it's your life, I guess. I, I still I still free sail pretty much all yeah. the time, <laughs> so uh, it's kind of fun to compete in a few events for me, just to do something different. I don't know. It's for me, windsurfing is free sailing anyway, even if I compete. So I will try to compete a couple more years for sure. Yeah. I mean, Kelly Slater is still doing events. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. I, I guess these are the sports where you could keep on going for a long time. You know, it's not like running or, or soccer and stuff where people get um, injured really badly that they cannot keep on going. You know, I think that's the, the nice part about windsurfing. So for me also, I can, I'm like, I'm almost enjoying it more every year. So I keep on saying like, oh, I'm going to stop in one, two, three years. But then every year I realize like I'm having too much fun to, to stop now. You know? have, have you thought of like just focusing, as you said, like before, just on doing waves or are you still like going to try and do as many disciplines for as long as you possibly can? Um, so I think the way I, I'm doing it now is that I just realized that slalom has like the longer lifespan or you can, you can have a longer career in slalom, but waves is more physically tough. So I said like, I should focus on that now since my body is like still young, let's say. <laughs> um, and then later on, if I want to refocus on slalom, I think that's the one discipline that I could get back into easier rather than, rather than waves and freestyle. So I'm doing like the more hardcore ones now and then yeah, later keep on doing. Okay. Anyway, they're all, they're all fun. It's like hard to stop <laughs> one. In the podcast with a quick fire round. So I'm going to start with if you could freeze a year in your life, what year would that be? <laughs> Wait, there's. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, would, I would say like now, 2009, or maybe like a set of years. Is that possible? Like, Ooh. yeah, for me, I would freeze a, a period from 2015 till 2020. It's like the, like I finished studying the year before that, and after that, I just went traveling like crazy, and it's been like the most fun time. So I would freeze five years. 
Mm -hmm. I would face one of the years that I don't remember because I was so little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like when I was two or three, I don't Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I, 19, 1985, <laughs> when, I, when I was one year old. <laughs> okay, if you could have one board and one cell for the rest of your life, what would it be? One yeah, cell. so I would choose the 4.5 the Wizard and a 80 liter, yeah, 80 liter Ultra Code. Because the freestyle cell, you can still tune it for waves, but a wave cell for freestyle is terrible, and the board is a board. I would choose my 86 Grip. Uh, and then for a four seven superhero, I would be happy with that. Pretty much, I've been using this every day now here for the last two months. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve uh, uh, for me, for me, it would be like driving to the beach all excited and realize that my adapter is not on my boom or something, or I forgot a screw for the fins. For me, it would be going to the airport without knowing how much you have to pay for the excess baggage Oof. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with a new with a new airline <laughs> that you don't know what's going oh. on <laughs> man that could be dramatic <laughs> and you have maybe four or five bucks with you yeah <laughs> okay this is like a funny one it's a wave that you'd never want to go back to or it can just be a spot well i i remember in the storm chase there was this wave in tasmania what I don't want to go back to because it was just crazy. <laughs> there was no beach. You had to launch from rocks and you could get completely destroyed before you touch the water, <laughs> kind of. And it was cold, it was scary and massive. And yeah, I don't want to go back there, actually. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I don't know. This year for the Starboard photo shoot, I got sent out at this spot at uh, in Geraldton in Australia. I forgot the name, but it has a very creepy name, like something like Gallows or Shark Boneyard or something. I don't know. Um, but apparently there's a lot of sharks that are passing there, and I was the only one that had to go out there. So it just <laughs> felt like I did not enjoy that session. Mm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't want to go back there. Yeah. yeah. Um, who's your favorite windsurfer on tour? Well, that has been on tour with me. I uh, would pick Kauli Seadi. Mm-hmm. He, uh, because I competed against him for many years and I really like his style of wave riding. From now, I think Brasinho. I like Brasinho a lot, the style, and he's really good in both tags and it's super amazing in massive waves like Josh and all that. Yeah, the thing is, I like so many riders, they're all of such different styles. Like, like Victor is one of my favorite riders at Pozo. Marcelio also, Ricardo also. Like they all add something, you know, so it's hard to choose for me, honestly. Um, like in slalom, Antoine Albo is such a machine. Matteo is coming up now. He's also performing like crazy. Pierre Mortefon. I, I just have a lot of respect for a lot of writers. Like with the girls, it's like Maike, Uda, Steffi, Lina. I cannot name one writer. I'm a, I'm a fan of everyone. Um, I'm just going to finish off with um, what is your life motto? Or if you don't have a life motto, what motivates you in life? For, for me, my main motivation is just progress. I, um, if it, if it, when it comes to windsurfing, I, the sport is so much fun because there's always something new to learn. And the better you get at it, the more you enjoy it, you know, and the more you want to keep on going, um, going on with it. So the fun is never ending. And I feel like, um, yeah, progress is the key to like, yeah, keep on enjoying things. So whatever I do, I just, yeah, strive to like get better at it. Mm, same as Aragida, like yeah. you know, like windsurfing just gives me pretty much all I need, and all I have, like my my friends, my family, I can share with them also windsurfing trips or going in the water with them, and yeah, sailing with friends at the same time I can train. It's amazing. Not many sports give you that. That they only some sports they just train to win, and we train to have fun at the same time. Yeah. And uh, do trips for, you know, photo shoots and all that. And we share now with so in social media so many great things with people that follow us and that they are, that they cannot go to these places, but they still appreciate it, what we do. So um, I feel really grateful to to winter and go to this place where we, we go. Yeah. Thanks for that, guys. That's been uh, Vic Fernandez, Sarah Keita and me, Lucas Meldrum. And uh, thank you very much, guys, for, for coming on and taking the time out. It's 
speak. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>